I'm standing in the entranceway of our local hospice unit. For those of you that don't know, hospice is a place that we can choose to go to to live out our final days, weeks, and sometimes even months. It's a place where people die. I have death anxiety. And as I stand there, I am nervous, hesitant, anxious. In common terms, I'm freaking out. And at the end of her leash, my dog is pressed up against my leg. While she's trying to stay within her comfort zone, me, I'm searching for mine. The door up ahead is open. There's a woman. She's colorless, wrinkled, frail, staring only up at the ceiling because that's all she really can do. She doesn't see us. I feel sick. What do I say to her? What if she dies while I'm alone with her? Now, are you all afraid of something? Snakes? Spiders? Maybe the upcoming swimsuit season? <laughs> it doesn't matter. The point is we all have fears. But here's the thing. What scares you may not scare you. Our fears are unique. But there is one thing that we have in common. Science tells us that our brains will react to fears in one of three ways. We will either come out swinging, we'll run for the hills, or we'll freeze like a deer in the headlights. Guess which one I was? <laughs> you got it. I know what dying looks like. I met a woman at the end of her life and it changed my life. Shifted my thinking on how to be more open and present with people who are dying. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Why in the world would this girl volunteer in hospice if she's so afraid of dying and death? Well, much like the well-known fear of public speaking, which I might remind you is ahead of the fear of death, I was terrified, actually, to be on this global TED stage. And yet I'm still here. I wanted to face my fears, see what was on the other side. But really, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make connections. But I couldn't do it alone. Do you also have a dog? One, maybe two dogs? See a few hands? Here's mine. She's a whippet, like a small greyhound, skinny and fast. And folks, I mean seriously fast. This dog can run 60 kilometers an hour. Her name is Iluka, and her and I became a pet therapy team in our local hospice. Our role was going to be just being with people who are dying. But I have to admit, I was kind of using Iluka a little bit. She was going to be my buffer, creating a bit of a safety net around me to ease my death anxiety. Back to my story. Where was I? Right, first day, hospice, freaking out. And all of a sudden, Iluka is confident and curious, and she pulls me into the room. Whew, I pull her right back out. I can't do this. What was I thinking? And then I see a name on her door, that woman's door. Her name is Frida. Right then a nurse is behind me whispering in my ear. Can you believe Frida is 101 years old? Whew, I'm thinking she's going to be 102 by the time I get in there. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't. We start to back away. Then I hear something, a voice. 
slow and steady. Please don't go. Can I pet the dog? <sighs> wow, this gutted me. I was embarrassed, shocked, sad. I just judged this woman, Frida, based on my feelings, my fears, how she looked, my death anxiety. I'm not a judgmental person, honestly. I'm kind, compassionate, empathetic. Aren't I? Iluka nudges me as if to say, come on, mom. She needs us. It's why we're here, right? Let's go in, sit with her, and it will be okay. So we do. Inside, there's a quilt covering Frida's legs. It's beautiful. Looks handmade. Yellow floral patches like daisies. Photos and trinkets fill her room. What I notice most, the most adorable Crayola drawings all along one wall. Dragons and dinosaurs. Tiny crystal figurines all along the windowsill. A Union Jack flag right above her bed. A big one too. And little yellow silk daisies scattered all around her room. There must have been hundreds of them. And there's a smell. It's sweet, like candy or cookies. Whatever it is, it's alive and cheery. There's a card on the table. It reads, I love you, Grandma Lucy. The same nurse, she's back. Oh, Frida, she just loves daisies. Can't you tell? And Lucy, that's her youngest granddaughter. She made that quilt for her. I knew it, handmade. This room was telling me such a beautiful story. It was Frida's story. Frida suddenly seems lighter and brighter. She senses our presence, and she tries to speak. Iluka stands as if to say, I'm right here if you need me. So I lift her up, put her on the bed. She does what dogs do, if I'm sure you dog owners know, spins around, fluffs up the quilt, nestles right into Frida's side. They are cozy. Frida's tiny, scrunched up, wrinkled lips are covered in bright pink coral lipstick. Yep, ladies, it is bleeding into the cracks and wrinkles all around her lips. We know how that can happen, right? And her nails, perfectly painted to match. It's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Frida is no longer that scary patient anymore. And this reminds me of psychologist Abraham Maslow's famous words. You may know them. You will either step forward into growth or you will step way back into safety. And I got to be honest with you, and I'm serious. I would have rather walked, no, run 10 miles barefoot through flaming pieces of my son's Lego. Oh, then walk into the room that day. That's how afraid I was. I was nearly paralyzed by my death anxiety. But with Iluka, I made it through that door. On our visits, Frida loved it when I held her hand. And every time, every time, she had to hold Iluka's paw every time. Now, sometimes we got so comfortable, Frida tried to sing. I tried to sing with her. But my knowledge of 1930s show tunes, kind of rusty. And sometimes, a lot of times, we just sat in complete silence. 
Not a word. Before I met Frida, I used to think communicating meant things like talking, body language, and eye contact. You might agree. But I soon found out I had to let go of those things. So I let go. And that was when I became comfortable without conversation, comfortable in my own discomfort, and we really began to connect. And boy, the things we talked about. Five months, we talked a lot. Would you believe Frida was married for 75 years? Yep, and to the same man, I might add. Good girl. Five children and many, many great, great, great grandchildren. And here's the big surprise, total shocker. She was a veterinarian, loved dogs. She told me they used to call her the dog whisperer. That's how she said it. I get it. After all, she saw us on that first day without even seeing us. I was becoming an important part of Frida's family, her new family. Families such as the incredible hospice, nurses and doctors caring for her with compassion, keeping her free of pain. The physiotherapists that would come in and encourage her to move her limbs. The young man that would often wheel her outside so she could see those daisies and breathe in the fresh air. And the teenage girls who volunteered to perfectly paint her nails, and give her makeup tips. We were her hospice family. Now, don't get me wrong, Frida's real family were amazing people, loving, supportive, but I never met any of them. They never visited. They lived too far away, in fact, out of the country. Every time I saw Frida, she greeted us with that bright pink lipstick smile and always reminded me that I, Luca and I were her only visitors every Saturday, 10 a.m. for five months. The nurses told me on Saturday mornings they always knew when it was a Saturday because down the hall where Frida's room was, all they could hear was, is my dog here yet? Is my dog here yet? Is my little puppy here yet? Yeah. Now, here we stand again at Frida's door. But something's not right. It smells clean, too clean. Where's the quilt, the drawings, the trinkets, the flag? It's all gone. She's gone. Frida died. Iluka lays across my feet and whimpers, and I sink to the floor in sadness. But then I feel peace. All Frida needed when she was dying was to feel connected, to feel alive. We gave that to her. But I wish she could know what she gave to me. She showed me how to just be me when I'm around people that are dying. The way I am with the rest of the world, open, honest, and especially listening to and leading with my heart. Two months ago, somebody close to me was dying. She needed my unconditional presence, my voice, and the warmth of my hand with hers. She was Iluka. She was my soul dog. I needed her. 
I feared her death in the same way I feared all deaths. She was supposed to be my buffer. This was her story as much as it was mine, and this was her little red circle to tell it from. But it was her turn to go. In Iluka's final hours, I can tell you, I didn't feel alone or afraid. I felt comforted and supported by Iluka. While I stood by her side physically, she was with me emotionally. She never took her eyes off of me. And it was as if I could feel her little paws holding on to my sad heart. And nothing else mattered. Nothing else. Because of Frida and Iluka, I am happy to tell you that my death anxiety today is just a whisper, like Frida would say. I know one day I'm going to die. Let's face it, none of us are getting out of here alive. And yes, I still have fear. But by choosing to connect with people who are dying, I have unlocked this incredible magic that was behind my fear. Peace and purpose. Remember our story and just be you, the way you are with the rest of the world. I challenge you to connect with somebody who's dying so that you too can unlock and experience the magic of truly meaningful connections. And if my great friend Frida was here today, I know she would tell you this. Holding hands makes me feel like I'm still important, like I matter. Having somebody and something to look forward to is life's only meaningful paycheck. The rest, her words, gobbledygook. And... I know she would tell you this, and probably more than once. Pink lipstick matters. <laughs> Thank you.